What we've got on the um, on the agenda for today um, are three clinical cases with a shared theme. Um, that's going to form the bulk of our, our presentation this morning. Um, then we're going to talk uh, briefly about improvements that we're putting in place um, for NUH and hopefully um, within the region as well. And then I believe Dr Levy is going to join us um, to update us on an audit looking at NMBA use. Um, and then we'll have a bit of time for questions and discussion. So our first case is a 60 year old female um, occupation of hairdresser um, who was admitted for a laparoscopic cholecystectomy. Um, she had quite an unexciting background of reflux and some recent pancreatitis secondary to gallstones. Um, and of note on her anaesthetic um, pre-op, it said that she had hives with day and night nurse. So this is her um, anaesthetic chart. Um, and you can see that she becomes quite tachycardic, 126 beats per minute, and quite hypotensive, low is 64 systolic, um, but no bronchi bronchospasm or laryngospasm. Um, and this is her, um, her AAGBI um, form um, that states what medications she had and when. So you can see that um, she received midazolam, fentanyl, propofol and rocuronium within a several minute period, the last medication at quarter part, at 13.14, and then subsequently very quickly became hypotensive at 13.15, tachycardic 13.16, and latterly developed uh, tachycardia um, about five minutes later. Um, so initially when the hypotension and tachycardia were recognised, she received some metraminol of 2.5 milligrams with some improvement. Um, but when she when her blood pressure started to improve, she came out in air tachycardia. Um, and at that point, she received I am adrenaline um, due to the skin changes and the previous cardiovascular instability and then some chlorphenamine as well. She was transferred to theatre and the decision was that because actually she'd stabilised and um, they would continue with the with the procedure um, and they managed to complete the procedure. So I don't know if anybody has any bright ideas as to what they think is the most likely cause of this episode of perioperative anaphylaxis. Um, you can see there what medications she had. If you want to put it in the chat, then um, please do. But our feeling was that the most likely um, thing was going to be the rocuronium, although obviously we have to treat, we have to test for all of them. Um, so just a word, um, unfortunately this lady, um, although she had a triptase sent, it was sent in the wrong coloured bottle and I believe the previous guidance on perioperative anaphylaxis online um, for NUH actually says a purple top, which is not correct. So please don't send us a purple top because it won't um, we, we aren't able to process it. Um, please send us a serum sample or a yellow top um, because then we will be able to do it. Um, so just a word about what usually happens with patients who've had um, perioperative anaphylaxis when they make it um, into the drug allergy service. So we usually will see them initially in a um, in a standard clinic appointment where we don't really do any testing because usually we have to order all the medications in to test them. So on that initial appointment, we assess them, um, make sure that they are fit for testing and fit in case we induce anaphylaxis in them. Um, we will take a history, find out about their um, general health, other medication issues, any problems with previous GAs or other medications um, and what things they've tolerated as well if they've had anaesthetics in the past. At that point, we'll usually send off a baseline triptase and specific IgEs um, if they're appropriate and available. Specific IgEs are only available to a small number of drugs um, and they're good. In, if they're positive, then that, that's usually fairly helpful in making us suspicious. But if they're negative, then it's not it doesn't rule it out. So we always need to go on and do further testing. Um, and the main specific IGs that we would do would be things like beta-lactam antibiotics to penicillins, chlorhexidine and latex. Um, we then arrange for the patient to come back for a, a drug allergy testing um, appointment in our challenge clinic, for which we order all the relevant medications in advance. So it's all carefully planned. 
And at that point, we make sure they're well to have the testing on that day. They've not got an infection or their breathing's not gone off. And um, we go through a consent process for testing because obviously we are doing something that might induce anaphylaxis. Um, and then we proceed with testing, which starts with skin prick testing, um, which you should be able to see on the screen here that um, it involves putting a little drop of solution onto the skin, as well as a histamine positive control and a saline negative control, gently scratching the skin with the lancet and waiting 15 minutes to see um, what, they, what they come up to. And we're looking for a wheel and flare of a set size. Um, and then if that, for all the medications that's negative for, we then go on to check um, intradermal testing and we start usually at very low concentrations and go up to higher concentrations. But these again are at non-irritant dilutions. And here you can see that the, um, this is intradermal testing. You, you basically create a bleb underneath the skin. So it is a little bit painful um, and we have to do it for all the medications we test for. So it takes quite a long time. You wait 15 minutes and again, you assess whether the bleb that you've put in has increased in size and whether there's any redness around it. Then once we've done all the intradermal testing, which sometimes we do for three concentrations, so it takes a while, um, we then may go on if we think there's a medication that actually was suspicious in the history, but we actually have identified an alternative agent that we think was the culprit, and we want to prove that medication is in fact um, safe for that patient to have. We may then go on to drug provocation testing. We use a graded oral challenge for beta-lactam antibiotics, and cephalosporin and um, ondansetron. And um, sometimes we do a graded subcut challenge for local anaesthetics. Um, and but in other centres, um, there are a few centres that offer graded IV challenges to neuromuscular blockade agents. That's obviously something that's um, that requires quite a high level of um, support and care and a helpful anaesthetist. Um, so it's not something that we currently offer in our uh, clinic too, because we don't have anaesthetic um, equipment and <laughs> and an anaesthetist on those days. Um, so this lady um, came to clinic. She had normal baseline tryptase and negative specific IgEs for chlorhexidine in latex. Um, we tested all exposures that she'd had prior to her onset of anaphylaxis, which showed negative skin prick and intradermal testing for succimethonium, pancuronium, fentanyl, chlorhexidine and propofol. Um, however, she had positive skin prick testing to neat rocuronium, which was what we thought was the culprit of her, um, of her um, anaphylaxis. And she also had positive intradermal testing to atricurium. Her midazolam, which actually was done several times, was equivocal for intradermal testing. And our recommendations for her um, were that she should avoid rocuronium and atricurium because she'd had positive tests and there was a significant history, um, and midazolam. She was then tested for mivacurium as well, in case that was an additional agent that could have been helpful for her, but unfortunately that was positive. Um, because her medadlam result was borderline, we felt that the most appropriate thing to do was for avoidance. But given that she cannot have NMBAs as well, um, we have been looking into liaising with the team at Leeds to look at a possible IV challenge for medadlam. But unfortunately, this lady still requires a clear plan for further anaesthetic management, and we haven't quite finished um, finished getting there, um, given that at the moment she can't have NMBAs or medadlam. Um, and that's something that we could discuss here, but I suspect we've got plenty of, of things to keep us busy. But that, yeah, that is something that 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 needs to be um, reached for this lady in conjunction with some wise and each the tests. So just a word about full codeine and neuromuscular blockade agents. So this this because this lady did have symptoms of hives with day and nightness and reacted to an NMBA, which does make us suspicious that that might that might well have been the route in which she became sensitised. So this is hugely in the news at the moment, or has been recently. Um, and essentially, there are a large number of patients who have NMBA and flaxis, but they don't have a prior history of drug exposure. And that's really confusing because in allergy, you have to have initial sensitisation to an allergen in which your B cells generate specific IgEs that specifically recognise that allergen or that drug. These then bind to your mast cells 
And when you come into contact with that medication again, that results in cross-linking of your IgEs on your mast cells and mast cell degranulation and allergic reaction. But if you've never had an NMBA, then how can you generate sensitization and IgA, IgE antibodies against it? So the hypothesis is that there is environmental exposure um, to something that results in sensitization um, to NMBAs. And there are these well-described highly immunoreactive tertiary and quaternary ammonium groups, um, which um, if you look at these um, down the bottom, you can see this is fulcodine on the left. In the middle, this is the structure of fulcodine. And here is um, saxomethonium. And you can see at either end of the saxomethonium, you've got these ammonium groups, these um, tertiary quaternary ammonium groups. And they're also, you can see them present um, in, in fulcodine. And um, so there was suspicion that fulcodine might be one of the ways in which you could become sensitized to these ammonium groups, which then cross reacts with, with NMBAs. Um, there was a study that showed um, that NMBA associated anaphylaxis was 10 times more common in Norway, where they um, were using fulcodine at the time than it was in Sweden. And that and fulcodine was subsequently withdrawn from Norway, and there was a significant reduction in NMBA associated anaphylaxis. Um, interestingly, that was um, more within females than within males. And there are a number of hypotheses as to why that might be. Um, firstly, it could be that there may well be occupational exposure to these quaternary ammonium groups um, through hairdressing or cleaning, cleaning products. Um, and women are perhaps more likely to have those occupations. It's also possible that women may uh, purchase more over-the-counter medications and therefore have higher exposure um, from that aspect as well. Um, and so, so there's, this is the hypothesis that fulcodine may be one way in which people become sensitised um, and then can have perioperative anaphylaxis on exposure to NMBAs. Now, we all know that fulcodine isn't really very good as an antitussive or a cough, an anti-coughing agent. And so it is now being withdrawn in the UK as it has been in a number of other countries. And um, so, there was a study that came out in March this year, which essentially was a case control study done in France. It was retrospective. And what these um, people did was they took um, a number of patients who'd had perioperative anaphylaxis and they divided them into people who'd had perioperative anaphylaxis secondary to an NMBA and, or, and people who hadn't had perioperative anaphylaxis at all. They'd all had a general, general anaesthetic, but the cases had had, um, had NMBA anaphylaxis and the controls hadn't. So no anaphylaxis in the controls and cases had had anaphylaxis to NMBAs. And they matched the cases for the controls, two, two cases to one control, um, and they also matched them for NMBA exposure. And then they asked a, a number of questions to look at exposures and occupation and um, and history um, and fulcodine exposure in the previous 12 months. And what we can see here is that comparing the cases with the controls, there was a significant difference in the number of cases who um, reported that they um, had occupational exposure as cleaners. Um, and there was a significant difference in the um, cases um, who had had prior fulcodine exposure in the preceding 12 months compared to those who hadn't. Um, so I think this is um, this is kind of part of the evidence that have made the MHRA say, well, if you've had fulcodine in the preceding 12 months, then um, you shouldn't have an NMBA. But actually, that's that's quite a big jump to make, because actually, if you look at the controls, there were still a number of those who had had fulcodine exposure in the preceding year, but didn't have NMBA anaphylaxis. Um, so NMBA anaphylaxis is very rare. Um, it's around one in 10,000 anaesthetics. 
Um, and the BSATI and Perioperative Allergy Network have now come out and said, actually, they don't feel that there's a benefit to asking about previous use of fulcodine containing cough medicines. Because actually, asymptomatic exposure um, is, is not necessarily um, going to pick up those people who are likely to react because it will pick up a number who actually will be fine with NMBAs. But actually, what is really important to check is whether they're symptomatic with fulcodine containing medicines. And that should be a red flag to consider whether A, it's appropriate to go ahead with an NMBA in that procedure, and B, whether it's appropriate to liaise with your local allergy team about um, looking at whether they need um, uh, drug allergy testing for NMBAs before any procedure. And normally we wouldn't see patients for drug allergy testing until there'd been a history of a reaction, because drug allergy testing is um, is only is improved um, in, in efficacy when you've actually got a history um, and, and a clear question that you're asking. We can't do it just because somebody's worried they're going to react to something. But in this situation, I think it is probably something that we would be happy to do because there is a if there is um, a clear possibility that patients who've reacted to fulcadine may um, may actually um, have problems with NMPA. So actually it's it's important to, to assess them before they go for any procedure because there is a history of reaction. And so we've just put on here a couple of links. There's an anaphylaxis.org um, fact sheet that they've released um, about general anaesthetics and fulcadine in cough medicines, which is um, a nice patient friendly read. Um, and there's also um, this statement that the BSACI and perioperative An allergy network have released um, that that kind of explains that rationale. So that's um, our first case. I'm now going to hand over um, to Dr. Cream, who's going to tell us about our second case. Thank you, Betsy. So I'm going to present this 42 year old man who's a referral from elsewhere. So I apologise for the quality of the reproduction of the uh, anaesthetic charts. So in June last year, he had a laparosp laparoscopic appendectomy um, and uh, the pre-op assessment was his BMI was 60. Um, there was assessment of his airways. Um, which were thought uh, to be acceptable. Uh, um, and actually the uh, possible diagnosis of obstructive sleep apnea uh, uh, was raised um, uh, and subsequently that's been made. Um, so he had his induction agents at 14.15 to 14.20, propofol, rocuronium, fentanyl, dexamethasone, ondansetron and coamoxiclav, all received um, without any um, significant um, uh, event. And he subsequently had tramadol, um, morphine, uh, and additional doses of rocuronium at 1520 and 1545. The surgery was done with um, chlorhexidine, um, and uh, uh, there was a central line and chlorhexidine exposure at 17.15. So at about quarter to six, there was a change in the anaesth uh, anaesthetist. Uh, and then um, they uh, supervised Sugamidex being given at uh, six o'clock, to which he very promptly uh, became hypotensive with SATs of 70%. So fluids and metaraminol were given immediately and they systolic came up to about 60. Um, developed a trunkal rash and facial swelling, but there was no further improvement uh, in the systolic blood pressure until he was given uh, adrenaline. And he had uh, intermittent IV boluses between 10 and 20 micrograms uh, and um, uh, ended up uh, on ITU with an infusion. Um, no further rocuronium was given, but he did have, have atracurium to assist the medical, uh, the, the ventilation. And there was a successful extubation the following day. And so the clinical diagnosis on the part of the uh, anaesthetist was that it was anaphylaxis and that the sagamidex was the cause. So he had tryptase levels done at the appropriate time. So 60 minutes, uh, four hours, and the baseline was about three or four days later. Uh, you can see that there's no um, particular dynamic rise and fall. So just as a reminder, um, what you're looking for is um, a peak value 
that is in excess of the baseline triptase, triptase times 1.2 plus 2, but that can be in the reference range. So it can be in values that are 11.5 or, or less, and around 10% will be within um, what would be regarded as normal. So this is in, in increasing appreciation that the values um, can be affected by um, the large volumes of fluids that you would hope that be infused um, during anaphylaxis. I think there are also cases where the uh, triptase doesn't show this dynamic rise and fall. You can pick up an extra 3% of cases by um, uh, measuring urinary N-methyl histamine which is more stable than histamine, but I, that's very much a, a sort of research thing. So we got him up for skin testing, uh, by which time he'd lost three stone uh, and was having uh, um, uh, ventilation overnight for his obstructive sleep apnea. So um, we did skin testing and, um, oh, they've got turned round. So if you go across the, uh, the top, um, the, the one on the far right is rocuronium, uh, the one uh, to its left is succinamethonium, and then we've got chlorhexidine and latex. And if you look at the succinamethonium, uh, the sugamidex um, intradermal, on the one in a hundred, there is some suggestion that there's a bit of more inflammation. But when you look at the one in 10, there is extension of the wheel and what this thing called a pseudopodia, which is a false foot, uh, which I, I'd never seen in intradermal testing before. Normally they just get a circumferential um, expansion. So that was a positive test. Um, but shortly afterwards, he developed a mild systemic uh, reaction and he had generalized itching, flushing and eyelid swelling. Um, and um, it was around uh, 60 minutes before he uh, um, settled after a double dose of cetirizine. It's worth noting that, that the, you roughly get about 0.4 of a milligram total dose with the intradermals. Um, so the final diagnosis, uh, the confirmation that the sugamidex was the cause. So sugamidex is a cyclodextrin. Um, uh, it's been described to me uh, before as a donut uh, that wraps around the rocuronium. I'm going to say it's more of a cream horn because actually some of the drug sticks out at the other end. Uh, when it mops up the rocuronium, you get reversal um, and um, that's rapid. Um, the allergen can either be the sigamidex itself or it's thought that you get the generation of a novel allergen by um, a, the combination uh, of the rocuronium sitting in the succinamethonium. So that's a different shape um, uh, that the um, immune system uh, is recognizing through IgE. And there's also some um, thoughts that uh, not all of the uh, reactions are IgE uh, um, dependent. So how common is it in the NAP6 um, uh, audit, there was uh, there were two cases, one of which was um, proven and the other one uh, was suspected. Um, so that that looked at uh, 64,000 um, administrations in the NAP6. Um, it was introduced um, much earlier in Europe and Jap Japan than the US and in fact it was introduction was delayed in the US because cons of concerns about hypersensitivity. So it wasn't introduced until around 2015, 2016. It's actually the leading cause of perioperative anaphylaxis in Japan. And it was uh, estimated uh, that 10% of the population received it uh, between 2010 and 2018. Um, uh, and that uh, points out it, it's expensive, but not that's not considered an obstacle in Japan. Um, if it was used at the same rate uh, in Europe, there was a paper that would suggest that there would be a third uh, more um, uh, perioperative uh, anaphylaxis episodes. 
So the database in Japan reckons that, uh, and this is from a national database, the incidence is in about one in 34,000 to one in 40,000. There was much higher um, uh, risk estimated in a single center study. But they've looked at healthy volunteer studies um, uh, and uh, giving them to Sagamadex naive individuals. And there have now been two studies. Um, and the incidence of reactions or the development of allergic symptoms from mild through to anaphylaxis is really quite high in these studies, one in 20 for mild and one in one in 150 for anaphylaxis. And so that's clearly not uh, being translated uh, into um, perioperative anaphylaxis that is declaring itself as being picked up in um, in theatre. But it might be that um, uh, these milder reactions uh, are obscured by everything else that's going on um, during a general anaesthetic, uh, particularly reversal. Um, and you're much more likely to get anaphylaxis uh, with higher doses. Uh, so the only two people in studies who got anaphylaxis um, were uh, people who got the high doses uh, and interestingly neither of them had tryptase rises which is a bit like our patient and oh there is this belief that, uh, that um, primary sensitization um, because these were naive um, to sagamadex um, is related to external factors such as drugs, uh, um, uh, diet uh, and, and other exposures. So psych cyclodextrins um, are increasingly used in processed foods and the reason why is that they that ability to capture um, a, a molecule within um, the basket also means that you can remove bitterness, you can add flavouring, and it also um, is uh, adds um, preservation. It's been used um, to stop pear juice from browning in the bottle. Um, these things aren't labelled on foods uh, necessarily. Um, in foods, uh, this, the rule is that if something is less than 10% of an ingredient, it doesn't have to be labelled. Um, so if you have something complex added and the cyclodextrin is less than 10% of it, it, you won't know that it's there. Uh, I saw in the, track, the um, chat that people knew about Febreze, um, uh, and that's another uh, way in which the um, uh, smell in this case uh, uh, is uh, picked up and uh, uh, collected and, and rendered uh, uh, um, pleasant, I suppose. And in fact, Febreze didn't uh, market terribly well until they added in another fragrance. Um, so it wasn't just the mopping up the smell, you needed to replace it with something pleasant. Cat litter. So allergists think that cats are the minions of Satan anyway. Uh, and the fact that the uh, cat litter uh, contains cyclodextrins and uh, uh, could be uh, a source of sensitization through airborne mechanisms because there's lots of dust um, uh, uh, would uh, also uh, be problematic. At the moment I, I did intend to go and look at uh, pets at home or whatever it's called but at the moment I can only find it in um, Japanese um, uh, cat litter and that no doubt is contributing to their very large um, uh, prevalence of perioperative anaphylaxis to the Sagamadex. So, um, thank you, Alex. I'm just going to move on to our final case. So, this is a 26 year old female who um, was term plus 14 and was induced for post dates. Um, she had a past medical history of SVT during her pregnancy but wasn't on any medications. Um, and this is the series of events. So, she uh, on the 10th of August at 11 o'clock at night she developed an itchy back under her epidural site and um, at 2.43 um, the following morning she developed sudden onset of nausea and then vomiting and hand tingling. They then struggled to find the fetal heart for a couple of minutes and then found that it was bradycardic. Um, at 2.54 she then developed swelling to her hands and feet, face and lips. 
um, and um, there were concerns about the fetal heart, which was not responsive to stimulation. Um, and at that point, there was a decision for a category one section. Our patient's observations showed she was tachycardic up to 170 beats per minute and hypotensive with a systolic of 80. And triptase is taken um, a couple of hours, well, an hour and a half or so after um, the, um, the swelling um, showed a significant peak in triptase of 31.4, which sev several hours later was falling to 19.9, and a baseline was 4.3. So that definitely constitutes a dynamic rise in triptase, as it's significantly more than baseline times 1.2 plus 2. So this is a very busy slide, but essentially the onset of significant symptoms was at 2.43 on the 11th of August. She'd been in for a while, being induced since the 8th, um, and you can see on here that actually there's lots of medications that she received in her period of induction, as well as an epidural. But actually, she'd been on all of these medications for a very long time before onset of symptoms. So the question was, what on earth was causing um, her, her symptoms, her, her reaction? Because she's clearly had anaphylaxis and it's most likely to be drug related drug induced. Um, and the AAGBI form, so these are lifted straight from the AAGBI form, um, the synthesis from the AAGBI form was that the suspected cause was either leather B pivocaine and fentanyl, lavender essential oils, which she was um which she started um just beforehand, or syntosinon. But actually she had no drug initiated in the two hours before her reaction. And she subsequently received syntocin on um, with no clinical deterioration. So what on earth is going on here? What, what is the actual cause of her reaction? So she came to clinic for an assessment um, and her specific IgE to chlorhexidine was positive at 1.94 um, with a negative latex specific IgE. However, um, she was unable to be fully skin and um, skin and intradermal tested at that point um, due to a combination of factors. She had two further pregnancies um, which in which we would not do drug allergy testing um, because of the potential risk of testing. Um, and we also obviously had the COVID pandemic in which we were not able to do um, to do as much testing as we are now. So she didn't have her testing completed, but with that finding of a positive specific IgE for chlorhexidine, she was advised um, to strictly avoid chlorhexidine in all circumstances. She Her two pre further pregnancies went very well and she had delivery under general anaesthetic without problems and tolerated syntocinon, succimethonium, propofol and morphine. So she finally came back to have her testing completed um, after the pandemic and having her um, subsequent pregnancies. And um, she was positive on skin testing for chlorhexidine, which confirmed chlorhexidine allergy um, and testing for other, um, other things for completeness, for the lidocaine, the pupivacaine, fentanyl, latex solutions was negative, And she also had a negative lidocaine challenge. And actually on asking further, she did have a history of symptoms when using a topical face wash in the past. Um, and she did also have occupational chlorhexidine exposure working as a nurse. So chlorhexidine allergy is something which is very commonly overlooked as an exposure in perioperative anaphylaxis. And it's something we really do need to think about quite carefully. Um, it's also something that is often present in dental procedures. Um, and these are a number of the exposures within a hospital context that um, you need to consider if you've got somebody who's had perioperative anaphylaxis. Obviously, there's skin prep um, using um, things, things like these, or chloroprep, which obviously has chlorhexidine in, surgical scrub in hydrex contains chlorhexidine. Um, and then there are things like instiller gel, which um, not only has local anaesthetic, but also contains chlorhexidine. Um, and there are also central lines which elute chlorhexidine. And um, so it's really important to consider these as well as drugs that you have given because administration of chlorhexidine is not usually mentioned on the drug chart, but it is something that is often fairly ubiquitous um, in, in, in surgery and in theatre. But interestingly, sensitisation of healthcare workers is rare. 
However, there are a number of other ways in which people can become sensitised to it, particularly in the community. And there are all manner of topical agents which may contain it from hand gels and washes, mouthwashes, um, toothpastes, other mouth products, disinfectants or antiseptics, um, shampoos, body washes, face wipes are a big one, skin creams, ointments, cleansers, antiseptic throats, throat lozenges and sprays, nasal sprays and also cosmetics. So there's a huge number of things that people may not be aware that they're using, which can um, provide a source of sensitisation. Um, and um, just as a, a side note, if you have somebody where you're suspicious or you're telling them they need to avoid chlorhexidine, there's a very useful patient information leaflet on chlorhexidine avoidance um, on the anaphylaxis.org um, site, which can be easily accessed. So um, it was noted um, in, in NAP6, this, um, this, this was um, mentioned that up to 80% of patients diagnosed with a chlorhexidine allergy had already reported a possible chlorhexidine allergy that could have been confirmed prior to that adverse reaction. And that's quoting um, several papers. So they came up um, in this very helpful paper that I read um, with a number of questions to ask to try and pick up um, a history of chlorhexidine allergy. Um, and there are these five questions. Have you ever been told you might be allergic to chlorhexidine? or disinfectant cleaning solutions, or lubricant gels? Have you ever had swelling in the mouth or developed an itchy rash when you've used mouthwashes? Have you ever had swelling or an itchy rash develop when your skin is cleaned before taking blood or putting a drip in? Have you ever had swelling or an itchy rash develop after using disinfectant or cleaning solution for minor scratches in the home or when asked to wash in it before surgery? Have you ever had a rash or swelling after a procedure in hospital or being told that you've had an allergic reaction during surgery, which was not investigated? And obviously that latter question is very useful, uh, not just for chlorhexidine allergy, but these are the specific questions that it may be helpful to ask to try and identify if you've got somebody who, who might actually be allergic to chlorhexidine. Um, and then this is just um, to demonstrate that there are the route of exposure um, with chlorhexidine influences both the reaction severity and the timing of symptom onset. So um, this table, you can see down the left hand side, you've got route of exposure, which cutaneous, mucous membrane and parenteral. And then the middle column looks at onset of symptoms after exposure, whether they're immediate or delayed. And then the final right hand side box looks at severity of reaction, whether it was just localised air to carrier, generalised air to carrier or systemic um, anaphylaxis. And what you can see here is that mucous membrane exposure, so that might be transurethral, so use of things like instilla gel or rectal or vaginal, um, can not only have immediate um, onset of symptoms, but also can have delayed symptoms, which may not happen exactly at the time that you give um, that you give chlorhexidine exposure, because what happens is you get uptake of the chlorhexidine um, and and then it will um, and then it will disseminate and bind to um, specific Ig on mast cells and say so that the process will not be straight away, it will be delayed. And those are the situations where you can see um, systemic anaphylaxis because you have a lot of exposure um, and, and therefore you get a lot of mast cell degranulation. Also parenteral, particularly um, central lines which elute um, chlorhexidine, those are also a risk for delayed, um, for delayed reactions. And they can also result in systemic anaphylaxis, which will not resolve until you remove that chlorhexidine eluting um, central line. So that just demonstrates that although you can have immediate symptoms with all of these, delayed is also possible. And that's probably why this lady um, didn't appear to have a clear medication that was causing her symptoms, um, but had probably had exposure to chlorhexidine during the course of her um, of her of her labor and her and her epidural um, and, and probably catheterization as well. So that was the chlorhexidine case. So we're just going to summarise by talking about um, actions in suspected perioperative anaphylaxis. So obviously you need to acutely manage the situation by recognising that this is anaphylaxis and treating early. 
Um, triptase um, needs to be a serum sample. And ideally, as soon as you're able to take one and you've stabilized the patient, you should send one. Um, a further one is very helpful within one to two hours of symptom onset. But it, if, you, if you haven't managed to get that window, then up, up to four hours post symptom onset is, is good. Um, and then a baseline at more than 24 hours. Um, and note that results for triptase may not be available to um, before the patient goes home. Sometimes we get calls in the lab to say, oh, have you got the triptase result? Um, that the, Usually the turnaround time is a bit longer, but it doesn't matter if you don't have the, the result before they go home. Um, it's really important to document all the potential exposures and things that they may be allergic to um, so that it's clear what they need to avoid. And that needs to go on the drug chart. They should have a red allergy wristband and they should also have an alert put on Medway. So we we ideally with the, these patients, they should have alerts put on Medway for every single exposure that is suspicious and that may have caused their perioperative anaphylaxis. Um, and we always go in and amend these once we've completed testing. But it's really important this is on so that anybody else who sees this patient um, and if they come into hospital, that will come up and, and act as an alert to them. Um, at the time of reaction or just afterwards, you don't need to do specific IgEs. Often specific IgE for a particular drug is consumed um, during the course of a reaction. So actually they can be falsely negative. And as we've said, they're only available for limited allergens. Before the patient goes home, then you need to make sure the documentation is all completed and clear. Um, please refer them to the perioperative anaphylaxis clinic. We'd really like to know the urgency of the referral is this has this procedure been able to be completed or not? And if the procedure hasn't been completed, how urgent is it that they go back to surgery? I.e., if they've got a life, a potentially life limiting, life threatening um, condition that needs intervention with surgery, and they've not been able to have that, then the urgency is obviously significant, um, and we will try and prioritise them as far as possible to get their testing done so they can safely go back to theatre. Whereas if the procedure is completed and there's no surgery planned, then we would do them a bit more routinely, um, and they may well have to wait a little while. Um, please send us a completed AHEBI form that provides a really important and helpful amount of information to aid us in our assessment and testing. And knowing what you thought was the likely cause of the reaction is really helpful for us when we when we review that. Please also send a copy of the anaesthetic notes and you can send that to anaesthetically at nuh.nhs.uk. Please make it really clear what they need to avoid. Consider all possible exposures in the preceding hour, and that includes skin prep, latex, and instiller gel. Um, oh, sorry. Make sure that um, a Medway alert has been completed with all suspected agents. And there is a really useful letter which NAP6 have um, provided a template for, um, which is in Appendix B2 and B3, in which you can document to the patient and to the GP what should be avoided and what's happened. And I've got that on the next, next page. And that should be uploaded to um, DHR as well as being sent to the patient and GP. Um, it's also helpful to debrief the patient, make sure they understand what's happened um, and that they have clear avoidance advice on what to avoid before they come to the allergy testing clinic. Um, make sure they know what's going to happen next and that, um, that they will be referred to an allergy clinic. We'll see them in assessment and bring them back um, for further testing. Um, and in terms of avoidance advice, it's always helpful if you can encourage the patient to set up an emergency medical ID of things they should be avoiding on their phone. And here's just a little example um, of an iPhone on how you can do that through the health um, section. And the other thing just to mention is that this is quite a stressful thing to happen for, pa for patients. Um, we've had quite a few who've come in and actually have been quite stressed and, and, and evidence of PTSD because they've expected to go in, have a quick procedure and be in McDonald's by the end of the day. And then they wake up in ICU having had anaphylaxis and their procedure hasn't been completed. So it is helpful if you can kind of counsel patients that they may feel um, a you know, they may feel a bit anxious or a bit um, lay well behaviour. They might feel a bit stressed and, and where to seek help for that in the interim if they need to. Uh, this is a copy of the um, letter that just details um, what happened and what they need to avoid. And it's really helpful in breaking it down to all the different medications that they may have had. 
Um, we are the perioperative anaphylaxis service and um, myself and Dr. Cream um, with Dr. Levy, who is our very helpful anaesthetist, and Kate Hopkinson, who is our ANP. Please do contact us if discussion would be helpful um, regarding a patient after the event, um, either by email or by um, contacting our secretaries. And in terms of where we're going, we would really like to update our information that we have available to you as a, a useful kind of one stop shop. Um, for resources and um, documentation for you. Um, so we're looking at revamping that um, and updating our referral pathway. So it's all very clear that it's on there um, with some patient information leaflets um, about particular things they might need to avoid, but also an information leaflet for the patient when they're referred to our service. And we would like to spread this not just locally, but also regionally, because I think there can be a bit of inconsistency in some of the information that we see we receive from out um, outside of, of NUH. Um, so you may want to have a few moments just to think about your take home learning. But in the interest of time, um, I will give you a list of what we hope that you may take home from this. But please do think about if there's specific things um, that you want to take home as well. So firstly, Triptase needs to be a theorem sample or yellow top. Any triptase is better than none. So please send one, even if you forgot to do it at the time. Um, sensitization to medications can occur outside of the clinical setting. We've looked at Fulcodine and NMBAs, and we've looked at Sugamidex and things like Febreze and other, um, other food items. Actually, you can become sensitized to things even if you haven't been exposed to that particular drug before. Um, and it may be that you um, end up unsensitized and, and developing reactions to unexpected agents. Um, symptoms with fulcodine should be a red flag for investigation for NMBA sensitization. But don't worry if people have had asymptomatic exposure and they've tolerated without any symptoms. That shouldn't be a worry. Chlorhexidine reactions can occur lot later um, than exposure um, timing and they can happen in the context of previous mild cutaneous symptoms with say skin prep or um, or face wipes so do ask about symptoms where they've had prior exposure to chlorhexidine and um, so gamma dex anaphylaxis is a reversal ph phenomenon so it happens a lot later than induction and incidence is related to frequency of use um, comprehensive and accurate AAGBI is of crucial importance and communication post-event is really important both with the patient and the GP and making it really clear what they shouldn't have in future. So thank you very much.